of a safety valve here, something we can all hide behind when we, do, we can quote scripture here. It's in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, verse 26, where the apostle says, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your anger or your wrath. Now we'll come back to that a little later. But while we're here in the New Testament, let's turn back a little more and uh, let's look at that little book of Titus, and just before you get to the book of Hebrews, I think, I'm on my way there, Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, so that you know that I'm not standing up here just preaching to you, this has a very real meaning to your pastor. Verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry. I'm glad that there's a little loophole there. He didn't say not to be angry. He says, just don't get angry soon. <laughs> not given to wine. Not violent. Not filthy lucre. And since we're here in the New Testament, before we slip back there to the old one, let's look at one other reference in the book of Colossians. And this time in the third chapter, and it's verse 8. But now ye also put off all these. Here's some things that we need to put off, put away from us. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, communication out of your mouth. Isn't it a sad thing to go places and have to listen to the rot and the filth of some people's conversation? You know, it's a terrible, terrible thing uh, of, the, of the blessing and, and the fun that a CB could be when you're on the highway, but you don't dare listen to the crazy things. They're so filthy that you don't hardly dare turn them on. I, I feel like some of these, maybe it's a good idea. This is a thought that just came to me. I think the next time I'm going to camp and I've got it turned on, I'm just going to open the thing up and read this scripture <laughs> and see what happens. It'll be interesting, won't it? Okay, I'm going to do that the next time. I'll report to you, let you know. <laughs> Nobody will talk to me the rest of the way up there, I feel sure. But in the book of Proverbs, there's another verse, and I think this will be enough for now to give us a scriptural background for where we want to go. The 15th Proverbs, the wise man tells us in verse 1, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Now, let me make some just off-the-cuff remarks about anger before we get into our study tonight. Every human emotion that you and I know anything about is introduced in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. Look at one more scripture for now and go back to the first book in the Bible, 
And let's look at the fourth chapter of this book, and let me call to your attention verses 5 and 6. But unto Cain and to his offering God had not respect. He had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, or very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou angry? And why is thy fault? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Here is the first introduction in the scripture and into the human race of anger. Which brings me to something that's extremely important. In the New Testament alone, there are no less than 276 references to think of that 276 references in the New Testament alone and in the Bible there are over 600 references to anger its consequences and the condemnation of it and instructions to anger now one of the reasons that the Bible talks so much about anger is because there isn't a one of us in this room but what we have experienced in our own lives, the experience of being very angry. All of us know what it is to be angry. And all the people said, Amen. I suppose that anger has destroyed as many lives and as many homes as any other single emotion that we know anything about. It's a very, very rampant, dangerous emotion. The book of Jeremiah, the word anger is used more in that book than any other book in your Bible. And you might be interested to know that it is used in reference to God being angry. Over and over and over again in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet reports about God's anger. And he tells the people of Israel what God is angry about. Now we'll have something more to say about that as we go along. I just mentioned the sixth thing is all men express anger. All of us express anger. There are none of us that, that are exempt from manifesting anger to some degree or another. It is a common emotion among people. Here's the seventh thing. Jesus was an angry man. We hear some people say, oh, let's just talk about Jesus being love. Well, it's nice because Jesus is love. No question about that. And we need to rejoice in the love of God. But let's don't forget there's a flip side to that truth. Jesus was angry. If you want to read some scathing words of anger, you read the 23rd, I think it's the 23rd or the 27th, let me check to be sure, either the 23rd or the 27th chapter of Matthew. I think it's the 23rd. Let's take a look to be real sure. <coughs> yes, it is. And, and if you've got a Schofield Bible, you can start about verse 13, the whole chapter, but we'll just start at verse 13. And if you do have a Schofield Bible, uh, Dr. Schofield put in his notes right at the top, he says, Jesus announces seven woes upon the Pharisees. And well, you, he, you know, he's not standing up in front and saying, whoa. <laughs> he is mad. And he really pours it out. And if you don't think so, just look. He says, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Can't you see his eyes firing red when he says it? Can't you feel the passion of his anger? For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you won't go in yourself and you keep others from going in. Boy, and he goes down through the whole list. 
And you say, this is contradictory. He says back in the fifth chapter not to call anybody a fool. And here's something for you theologians. Look at verse 17. Then he turns around and says, you fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is, is upon it, he is bound. You fools and blind. And just read on through that. Look down in verse 27. Well, he really does get stirred up. He says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You're just a lot of white tombstones full of dead men's bones. Bunch of stinkers. <laughs> Get mad. Now, he was an angry man. That's not the only place. We could share some other places. He, he got angry when they judged him and condemned him for healing on the Sabbath day. And there were some folks that just thought it was terrible that he blessed a man on the Sabbath day. And the Lord gave them a scathing rebuke. Remember when Mary broke the alabaster box? And there were those that were condemning because she used such an expensive thing. And they said, well, she should have sold that and gave it to the poor. Wasted on this Jesus. And Jesus became angry. And he rebuked them. Do you remember when he got himself a whip? I'm sure, oh, he didn't really get upset. He went and says, now, you people just... <laughs> he was stirred up alright we'll talk about that later too and then the last thing I want to say just by way of introduction the scriptures tell us that we must be extremely careful about fellowshipping with an angry person because anger is a contagion did you hear me Ang anger is contagious and if you fellowship with an angry person, it won't be long until you'll be stirred up. That's why it's important to fellowship with a victorious person. Fellowship with someone that's positive, and you'll be positive. Fellowship with someone that's got faith, and you're going to have it. You fellowship with some critic or somebody, and you're going to be filled with criticism if you aren't careful. Some of the folks are here that used to hear Dad preach. And I'd say this out in convention. Dad used to say, you want to be careful. You run around with a polecat, you're going to smell like one. <laughs> so those are a few remarks about anger. Now, what is anger? Listen, this is just out of the dictionary. It's, I mean, this is no great revelation, but it's all backed up by the scripture. Listen, what is anger? Anger is an emotional reaction of hostility let me say that again. Anger is an emotional reaction of hostility that brings personal displeasure to ourselves and often to others. It is a personal, emotional reaction of hostility. Now, here's the next thing I want to share. Two things about anger from Ephesians 4, 26, where the Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Here's the first thing, and I'm just laying a background for us. Number one, anger is a God-given emotion. We all need to thank God we can be angry. Because if we couldn't be angry, we also couldn't love. <coughs> How many are glad you can get mad about something? <laughs> Boy, you're afraid to answer, aren't you? Okay. Number two. Here's a surprise. We are commanded to be angry. Be angry, Paul said, but don't sin. <coughs> that is a command. It is so structured in the language that Paul was saying, be angry. Now, it'd be a terrible thing for us not to be angry about some things. I think we have a right in our community to be angry about the porno shops that are here in the city. We have a right to be, not, not at the people operating them. Now I'll get back to that in a little bit. We mix it up. We get mad at the people rather than get mad at the wrong and at the sin. And then it becomes a venomous, vindictive sort of a thing. 
Just because we're against that pollution in our city doesn't mean that we hate those people. We love those people. We just wish that they would give as much energy into something worthwhile. Yeah. They'd make a good deacon if they'd just get saved. <laughs> fact is I wish some of them would get saved. I wouldn't be surprised they'd be a good witness for Christ, better than some of us self-righteous Christians. I hope some of you porno people are listening. <laughs> we love you, but we just hate that stuff you're peddling. And we get mad about it, and we ought to get mad about it. Would you say, man, be angry, just don't sin. Okay. Now, Anger, this is the third thing I want to say, anger is not necessarily sinful. Just because you got mad, don't let the devil hang a guilt trip on you unless you sinned in your anger. And we'll identify that in just a few moments maybe. And here's the fourth thing that little verse tells us. Anger must be controlled. Don't let the sun go down with you still stirred up in that anger emotion. Don't take it to bed with you. Now, what causes anger? I have written down eight things that, that are basics. I know a lot of incidentals. And maybe you'd like to take note of them so that you can refer to them. Here's the first one. Now, some of this is going to get pretty tough. Are you ready? Here's the first one. We get mad when we can't have our way. And all you... <laughs> All you got to do is watch it. Now, you, you, don't, you don't have to learn that. It's natural. Have you ever watched a child? Phil was telling me, and I couldn't help but be amused because he and Terry, uh, and I know this is Grandpa speaking, but they, they don't know how fortunate they are because the Lord has really blessed them with two sweet boys, but the, the, the oldest boy is a real sweet disposition boy, and and up until just recently, almost anything you would say, Anthony, we'd like this, or you'd like this, or let's do this, he's, he's responded without the slightest indication of any real rebellion. But Phil came in the other day, and I saw a little frustration on his face, and he says, Dad, you just wouldn't believe what happened today. And I said, oh, really? What happened? He said, you know, we went out to where we're building our house, and, and we, because we're living in this little apartment, he said, we didn't have any place to put the swing set. So we took it out there, and we, we put the swing set out. And every once in a while, we go out, Anthony goes out and swings on his swing set. Well, they went out and got involved in something and started to walk. And, and his dad said, now, Anthony, there's a mud puddle. Don't you get in that. Now, who ever heard of telling a three-year-old boy not to get into a mud puddle? <laughs> And for the first time that they can see where it was just open rebellion and self-will, he didn't go, he was very obedient, he did not go and walk in the mud puddle. He went and jumped in the mud puddle. <laughs> and when he did that, his dad said, now you are not going to go swing. And then he says, but Daddy, I want to go swing. <laughs> and he started. And his dad said, you come back here. And he just stopped and looked. He says, but I want to swing. <laughs> now his dad's coming out in him. <laughs> and his dad got it from his mother. conflict started <coughs> and Phil had to get really tough and for the first time Anthony became very angry he stiffened up when his dad took him and and began to pull his arms up when his dad tried to put him in his seat and he just wouldn't you know he just all of a sudden the whole thing <laughs> you know what caused all that he didn't get his way. 
And then he calmed down after sobbing and crying, and they did some other things, and he did a couple of things that were very, very nice to his dad, and he was very, very obedient, and they forgot all about the swing set, he thought. And his dad said, now, Anthony, you've been a good boy, so dad is going to go let you now. So you understand, dad is now going to go let you go down the slide one time. <laughs> and he said, Dad, two times. <laughs> and Phil said, No, one time. <laughs> so he went up and went down, and Phil got him and took him in the car. And just to show you he's not going to be defeated, when his mother said, Did you have a good time? Anthony said, Yes, I went down the slide two times. <laughs> It's one of the causes of anger, and we laugh at it in a child, but we're just exactly like that when we don't get our way. It can precipitate anger. I've seen it happen in church. I've seen it split churches because someone didn't get their way. I've seen it tear up homes because somebody didn't get their way. I've seen it destroy friendships because somebody didn't get their way. I've seen people lose out with God because they didn't get their way. I've seen some folks get angry at God, very angry at God, because they didn't get what they wanted. <coughs> Here's the second cause, pain. When you lash out because you're hurting, and that, this is something I wish I had a lot of time to talk about, and I can only go down through this list very quickly because I'm, I can see I'm not going to get very far tonight. <laughs> but pain, and we have to be very sensitive. Sometimes people lash out in anger when they are hurt. Now, not, I'm talking about hurt physically, but I'm also talking about being hurt emotionally and psychologically. There are some folks, because of their hurt, they, they, they flash out and strike back. And we have to be tremendously careful when we go through any kind of an experience that's caused hurt to us. Because the natural tendency, if we don't discipline ourselves and keep ourselves under control and realize what's happening to us, we can strike out in an innocent situation because we are hurt in some area of our life. And it is a defensive protective device. <coughs> I have seen some people and have counseled with some that had great ex explosions of anger. And when you got to the root of it, you found out it was merely a manifestation and a release for something that had happened in their lives. In some cases, it could happen way, way back yonder. There are some people that have been hurt way back in their early life, and they've never come to grips with it. And I'll deal with that maybe in just a little while longer yeah, through this message. But pain and, and, and hurt can cause us to become angry. It can happen physically. Have you ever seen an animal that was hurt and you went to help that animal and that animal, instead of showing any appreciation to your effort to help it, actually would strike out in anger at you? That's true with a human animal, too. Here's the third thing. Anxiety, worry, frustration are problems that we can't deal with and are prone to blame someone else for them. Now, hear this carefully. Don't miss it. Problems that we can't do anything about and we are prone to blame someone else for it, then we strike out in anger because we are now surrounding somebody else with the cause of the problem that's root in us. The warning is, be careful and be sensitive as spiritual people. This is what it means to be full of the Spirit. I get sick of people talking about being full of the Spirit and think full of the Spirit is some sort of an emotional manifestation. They go, I'm full of the Spirit. Well, they could be full of baloney. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Being full of the Spirit is recognizing that there are areas in our lives where there can be tremendous frustration and problems that we can't handle and how we respond to those frustrations and to those problems determines how full of the Spirit we are, not how well we sing in church. Amen. Can somebody say amen? Amen. All right, here's the fourth cause. Injustices. Things that happen to us or about us that's not right. Uh, some of you brethren, I don't know, Bob or someone that knows how to turn on the fans. If they're not running, would you turn those on? I see a lot of people fanning. I don't maybe maybe it's not the atmosphere at all. Maybe it's the message doing it. <laughs> Injustices. There is no way in the world that we can live in our lives, and especially and particularly as Christians, without having injustices to come to every one of us. And if you think you can come to church and that's the place you're going to avoid it, let me tell you something, that's the place God's going to arrange it for you. Are you still out there? God is going to arrange it. You say, well, Brother Pena, why is God going to arrange a thing like that? Why will God let something like that happen? Because God is desperately interested in developing in us the Christ-like spirit. That does not come, brethren, as a gift. Fruit must be developed. Christ-likeness is not a gift. It'd be nice if you could just be zinged from heaven and all of a sudden we'd all be like Jesus. <laughs> if that were the case, I'm going to start praying, oh, God, zing some more people. <laughs> doesn't happen that way. It happens because it is produced in us. And so God, by his wise providence, arranges for his people to experience these things so that we can handle them according to his purpose. And when we handle them in the disciplined way God wants us to, then we are growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And the character of Christ is then manifest in us. the fifth cause. Jealousy. I wish we'd had time to read the story in the 18th chapter of, of 1 Samuel where Saul, the great king of Israel, has, has just welcomed David into his house because David killed the Goliath and comes marching in with the head of that big fellow and presents it to Saul and the women are outside singing. And they're singing, Saul's killed his, thou his thousands, but David's killed his ten thousands. And jealousy gets a hold of Saul because he was very insecure in his position anyway. The Spirit of the Lord was already lifting off of him, and he'd, he'd already disobeyed God and taken things into his own hands, and God was getting ready to replace him, and this spirit of jealousy got a hold of him. And some of you will remember when I talked about temper not long ago, that in that fit of anger, suddenly, because he was jealous of David, David begins to play on his guitar and sing, and Saul, who was mighty good with the javelin, he was a mighty fighter in the household of Israel, he flung a javelin and it went past David. David stepped out of the way just in time, and the scripture says Saul intended to pin David to the wall. Now, I don't know about you, but I've thrown a few javelins in my day. Have you ever thrown a javelin? Said, I'll get him, I'll pin his hide to the wall. And the only sad thing is, there have been a few times that I hit a pretty good mark. Not too proud of it. I'll tell you how serious that was. It happened in his anger because of his jealousy against David. And if you'll flip on past the 18th chapter, I don't remember the exact chapter, but around 20 or 21, about two or three chapters on farther down the road, you'll find out that all of a sudden his son, his own flesh and blood, comes into the room and Saul with that same violent anger because of his jealousy, because Jonathan befriended David. Now the anger was not only against David, but was against his own flesh and blood. And Saul... 
Well, that's terrible. That just couldn't happen. Oh, but wait a minute. How many times have you and I, in our anger, thrown a javelin to destroy somebody because we were resentful and jealous over that person? Here's the sixth one. Rejection by others. Have you ever been rejected? Have you ever been kicked out of a church? <laughs> <laughs> have, have you ever gone to work and thought your job was secure and had them to hand you a pink slip and all of a sudden they just said we don't want or need you anymore <laughs> now I don't know maybe you're made out of different stuff than I am but that really hurts have you ever put your hand out to someone to shake hands with you and, and they didn't do it <laughs> oh that's an experience you'll never forget <laughs> That hasn't happened to me too many times, but I've had it to happen. I stuck my hand out a few years ago to a man, and he, he just wouldn't shake hands with me. <laughs> now, I'll tell you, I know in me, the normal thing for me to have done would have been to get, to get mad, you know, been angry about it, say, well, you so-and-so, you. <laughs> but it was so funny that I didn't have time to get mad in that particular case. <laughs> Rejection by others. Oh, it's a terrible thing. Have you ever seen a boy and a girl go together and then they were lovey-dovey and then all of a sudden something happened and then their relationship broke and, and one of them was rejected by the other one and the person that was rejected, if they're not careful, get very, very angry? They aren't married to love him anyway. <laughs> and besides, let me tell you some things I know about it. <laughs> okay. The seventh one, I'm not going to dwell on these very long. The seventh one, fear. Fear make you angry. And here's the eighth one, and I, I want to mention this one from the right straight from the scripture, and it's it's the word provocation or to provoke. And let me say this for the benefit, especially of you parents, and, and particularly you fathers that are here. When Paul was talking about it in the book of Ephesians over in the sixth chapter, let's look at verse four very quickly. For the scriptures say, and you fathers provoke not your children to anger, to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Do you know that I have watched in my days some parents tease their children when they knew in the act of teasing them they were making them mad and they continued to do it until that child was angry and then laughed and thought it was funny? Not realizing that what they were doing was conditioning that child to respond with anger. We can be provoked to anger. That's the reason we've got to be very careful. Grievous words, the wise man says, stirreth up anger. That's the reason our words must be seasoned with salt. Because I have the ability, like you do, to so say things that will stir the anger of people. Have you ever seen people stir a riotous spirit in someone? Stand up with a microphone and begin to blare out their words of anger until after a while a whole company of people responds as a result of that anger? Now that's what causes it. Can I go a little while longer? Because, boy, I just scratched the surface. Here's the fifth thing I want to bring in this little outline. Anger, now listen carefully, and I think I can help some of us. Anger is either conscious or unconscious. Now, put your thinking hat on. Conscious anger is very, very easy to describe because it, it is openly expressed. We are vocal. There is a temper response. Sometimes, and this is the sad part, violence, anger that's conscious, breaks out in a violent act. I'm thinking of the young man I mentioned to him. He's in the hospital and I suppose would be transferred from there to jail. The young man that we've known who shot the very girl that he was getting ready to marry next week because they got into an argument and he became angry. And in his anger, he became violent. And in his violence, he became a murderer. 
and shot the very girl that he was getting ready to marry. Graduate of Christian Training Center. It's how quickly it can happen. Conscious. Now that's dangerous and that's difficult and that's, that's, that's a terrible thing to happen when there is a conscious anger and we give vent to it. But let me tell you what's a lot more dangerous and a lot more subtle and a lot more devastating. And that's what we would choose to call subconscious or even unconscious anger. That's anger that is in us that we're not even aware of. Now, let me explain this. Past wrongs and past failures and past experiences that have never been dealt with in the light of the cross. I want to repeat that. Because past wrongs and past failures and past inconsistencies and past hurts and past frustrations that have not been dealt with are driven underground. And they are inside us. Now listen to this, and I guess if you miss everything else I say, I pray that you will underscore this right up there someplace where maybe you can refer to it. Let me just read it right out of my own notes. We cannot be sensitive to other people's needs when we are angry because anger insulates us against other people's feelings. When that anger is so much uh, built into us, and I'm going to tell you in just a moment how we can know whether or not this anger is built into us. Because there are things that we do in our everyday life that determine whether or not that anger is built inside of us. Something that has never, ever really been brought to the foot of the cross. There are many in this room hearing me preach tonight. You are God's people and you love God and you're trying to be faithful to God. But anger that has been a part of your inner spirit has never been dealt with according to the scripture. And some of the things that happen to us is a direct result of that anger that's subconscious. That's the reason the Bible says so much about it. Now, here's item number six. What is righteous anger? Let me go through it quickly. First of all, righteous anger is controlled anger. It's anger in absolute control. Saul did not have righteous indignation or righteous anger because he lost control. In his anger, he flung a javelin. Jesus had controlled anger. He was anger with a motive and with a purpose and with discipline. Number two, Righteous anger is anger without resentment. No personal retaliation or no personal vindication. I am not angry at the person. I am angry at what the person has done. When our anger is a venomous response to the individual, then we're out of tune with what Christ wants us to be. Number three. Righteous anger is not selfish. I am not angry because I am wrong. It's not poor me. Do you know what they did to me? That's the reason I'm doing this to them. That's selfish anger. Number four. It is not against people but against acts and actions. And number five. It must be with a proper motive. Why am I angry? If I am angry at what is happening in some of the areas of our city where we want to see them cleaned up and I am angered because I want that cleaned up. I don't want it to affect and to pollute any more of our young people than necessary. I wish it was not possible and not in our society. Then that is righteous indignation. If I become angry at the people that are there, that is unrighteous indignation. Now how do we express anger? Number one, we repress it or deny it. Have you ever seen anyone do something like this when they were just so mad they could bite nails and they say it like this, I'm not mad. <laughs> Never have been mad. 
Won't you excuse me? I'm being mad for. <laughs> Have you ever done that with your wife? See, see. Honey, is anything wrong? No, of course not. <laughs> and you're so mad you're about to blow up. You know, that's denying it. That's repressing it. Okay? It creates negativism. And you can always know it because connected with it is sarcasm. Are you listening? Are you listening? Now, I know I'm hitting home on some of you because some of your face is red as a beat. <laughs> Just all the blood's gone up there, particularly when your wife puts you like this in the ribs. <laughs> I want to say that again. You can always tell when it's there when you're repressing it because you, you, you're, you're so proud that you haven't blown up and you haven't torn up something, you haven't thrown something, you haven't said something that you shouldn't have said. You've just been sarcastic. And Christians usually wrap the sarcasm up in spirituality, which, which makes it even more miserable. <laughs> and particularly when you say, well, it's okay, I think I'm going to go pray a little while. <laughs> Okay, here's the second thing. If we don't repress it, then we suppress it. We know it's present. We know it's there, but we refuse to do anything about it. We just suppress it. You see, this kind of hostility produces stress inside of us. Nobody can absorb anger. We are not built to absorb anger. We must get rid of anger. You can't take it in and absorb it into your bloodstream. It won't work. It won't mix. You can't handle it. No person can absorb it. When we bury anger, we bury it alive. Can I repeat that? When we bury anger, we bury it alive. And when anger is buried in us alive, it scratches and it kicks and it bites. And it digs and it destroys and it devastates and it tears down and it weakens and it frustrates and it finally kills. Here's the third way. Either repress it, suppress it, or express it. Now, here's another way to get rid of it. Some people express it by saying, some men say, okay, I'm going to express it. I, I'm angry, angry at someone, and I'm just going to go play around to golf. <laughs> so they go out there, they put the golf ball down. <laughs> and they look at the golf ball, and they say, I see that person's face. <laughs> and for a little while, it feels good. Now, some folks go, they, they, they go and drink. They, this is just the excuse we need because now I'm angry and I'm going to express my anger. Things aren't going the way I want them to go, so I'll just go lie down and tie one on. You watch a lot of people that are pouring their lives out in drink are people that are angry. Build up inside of them. And that's the way they're doing it. Some do it in some sort of a violent way. They are expressing it. Now, I'll just say this and then come back to it in a moment. It gives temporary relief. But it doesn't give victory. Now, I want to come back to that because that's one of the most important things I want to say tonight. And here is the fourth way. Express or repress it, suppress it, express it, or confess it. And when I talk to you about confessing, and I'll show you how we can get real victory. Now, I, I'm going to take three or four more minutes and give you the effects of anger and why it is so desperately important that I communicate this to you some way. Here's the first effect. It's, it has a, an effect on us physically. It is impossible to get angry without something happening to your blood pressure. Zoom, up it goes. Something happens to your eye. Something happens to your stomach. Have you ever gotten angry and it's just like a really big knot in the pit of your stomach? Yes. 
and anything that you eat just goes to a great big hunk and a lump <laughs> and you have indigestion and you take out the seltzer and it doesn't touch it so those are some of the physical things and you end up sick here's a second thing boredom effects of anger get tremendously bored number three breaks fellowship with others a person that is angry soon finds themselves in broken fellowship people are not comfortable around an angry person and they begin to be isolated you watch an isolated person and I'll show you an angry person I want to say that again because I want to zero, zero in on some of you some of you say well I don't have any friends you better check up on yourself because there's a lot of folks around here wanting to be a friend and maybe you're so full of anger and animosity that no you won't let anybody be your friend here's the fourth one depression I want to come back to that quickly here is the fifth one a critical spirit you watch anyone that begins to criticize either in their work or at home or in the church or in their lives whatever it is all of a sudden it's every time you're around them it's always something critical and I'll show you an angry person here's the sixth one sarcasm that is always hidden behind this kind of a phrase oh I was just kidding I didn't really mean it I was just kidding there's not anyone that ever gives sarcasm when they're just kidding. Sarcasm is always a manifestation of, of hidden anger. Now listen carefully to that because that's important. Here's the seventh one. Gossip. When we start talking about someone else. Now, if you miss this, you've missed everything that's important that I wanted to say tonight to share with us. I have just given you seven things that are effects of anger and in no sense am I saying that's that's the sum total of the wisdom but certainly that is the direction that the scripture leads us. Now listen carefully to every one of those effects get this to every one of those effects there is temporary relief and that's what makes it dangerous Follow me now. Let, let's take, uh, let's take uh, well, I could take any of them, but maybe sarcasm. Let's take sarcasm. Okay, I am angry, so I express my anger in sarcasm. When I do, the effect of the sarcasm gives me a moment's relief. See, well, I feel good. I, they got the message. I told them. Now, that relieved me. That satisfied me temporarily, but it didn't give me the victory. So now, since that was the way to get a little bit of relief, I developed the sarcasm. That's the way a man becomes an alcoholic. He does get a little relief from the drink. He says, okay, that was great. That made me feel good. That's wonderful. So now, since I feel good and it came from that source, that justifies my doing it. So I want to feel good, I'll do it some more. And I want to feel good and I'll do it some more. And I want to feel good and I'll do it some more. And I do it some more and some more. And all of a sudden, the thing that was the relief becomes our master. There are some of you that have had depression and you're in depression all the time. It's because there is inner anger and you have hidden in a depression and that initial depression was a relief from your anger and instead of getting victory over your anger you continued to seed it and to feed it with your response of depression until now depression is your master are you listening I'm helping some of you you say, oh, it's not really important. It doesn't really make any difference that I'm critical about someone. Do you know that there's a great deal of satisfaction temporarily on being, in being critical? 
Because when we are critical about someone else, we are putting them down and we are selfishly elevating ourselves. I am making myself better than they because I am criticizing them and I am pushing them down, which now makes me feel better temporarily. So I felt better temporarily when I did it. So every time now that I don't feel good and want to build myself up, I criticize someone else. And in the act of criticizing someone else, I continue to buoy myself up. And in the process of that, it isn't long until that critical spirit possesses us. <coughs> Brethren, am I communicating this? Is it going through? Okay. Now, that's the reason it's important. Now, let's ask ourselves the question. Am I bored? <coughs> Have I broken fellowship? Do I feel all alone and ostracized and nobody has anything to do with me? And I'm a member of the body of Christ? Am I depressed? Do I find myself being critical and seeing things always in the negative light? Is, is, there, is there a tendency for me to be sarcastic? Do I enjoy getting on the telephone to find out what the latest is? Now, when we are possessed with that sort of a spirit, I want to repeat this. We insulate ourselves against anybody else's feelings because we constantly justify where we are and so we're insensitive about anybody else's needs, anybody else's wants, anybody else's burdens, anybody else's problems. And the moment we get around someone that emphasizes their problem more than ours, we don't want to be around them anymore because we have insulated ourselves against them and we have turned this whole thing into us and we have become so spiritually selfish and so moved and concerned about ourselves that we are now of no real value to the family of God. That's the reason the Bible talks so much about anger. Now, I've gone longer, but I, I'll, I'll just dismiss you here in a half minute or so. How do I get the victory? I, I've got to give you this, so be terrible. Say all this and then not tell you how to get the victory. Six things and I'll go right, right down the list. Confess it. First of all, confess it to God and tell God straight out that you have been hurt and that you're angry and you're upset and, and, and ask God to sanctify your past. Maybe you've been hurt back here. I have known people that have been hurt in their homes, children that have been hurt by a dad or a mother or some relative and that anger's been driven inside and out of them has poured all of these things I've been talking about and they've never gotten spiritual victory and they run from one service to the other asking people to lay hands on them for temporary relief when God wants you to get that rooted out of you and confess it to God say God it's there and I'm asking you to do something about it don't excuse it, confess it Secondly, confess it to yourself. Say, Lord, I've just let anger. And I'm asking you to help me. And third, go to the one that you have been angry about if it's possible. And do not be vindictive to that person. Say, I have been angry over the situation that's developed because of us. And I want you to know that I've had no right to be angry and I'm sorry. Don't excuse yourself. And you'll get free. Here's the second thing. Refrain from close association with anger-prone people. <clears throat> Number three. Control television and shows where there is a display of anger and violence. Parents, listen to the preacher. I don't usually harp on these things. But I'm talking about a very devastating thing. You can't let your children's minds be filled with that kind of business and expect it never to have an effect. That's the reason I urge you to get your children into Sunday school and into the classes and bring them into church and expose them to, to the feeling of the Spirit of God that brings life because all day long they're exposed to the other. That's the reason I urge you to get them in a Christian school. 
You say, I can't afford it. You can't afford not to do it. Do without something else. Sell your car. Do something else. And get them in where they can be exposed. And God forbid, Dick, there ever be an, an act of violence from a teacher or anyone else in one of our schools. Number four, be honest in your communication. Talk over stress areas. Don't turn them in. Number five, ignore petty arguments. Now that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Because there's a lot of ego involved. But we never have any winners in a petty argument. And number six, release pressure the moment it starts to build. Release the pressure. And here are four ways to do it. Number one, rest. Number two, pray. Number three, fill your mind regularly with some of the promises of God. I urge you into the Psalms. I urge you into the Proverbs. I urge you into the Gospel of John on a regular kind of a basis. And number four, fellowship with people that have the victory. Fellowship with the people that, that are positive. Fellowship with people that love the church. Fellowship with people that love the preacher. Don't get around those folks that don't love the preacher. Because listen, if you get around those that don't love the preacher, then the preacher can't help you. If you're not going to love me for any other reason, just love me because I can help you. How many know that I've got the means and the vehicle whereby I can help you? And why, there, there are a lot of doctors that I don't particularly like, but man, I'm going to be good to them because they can help me. Phil's going to find out. He's going to the dentist this week to have some stuff done up here. And, and uh, he's a little anxious about it, and he needs to be. When he stops to think, that fella could slip and drill a hole right up through the top of his head. the elders to come and stand across the front of the church. Precious Lord, this has been perhaps one of the most important messages on our emotions that I've shared yet. And I'm asking you to bring a real sweet healing to a lot of people tonight. In Jesus' name. And some, Lord, that have had unconscious, subconscious anger. Something has happened in their life that's caused them maybe way back there. And they've never dealt with it at the foot of the cross. And tonight they've been made aware that it's present because of their attitudes, depression, broken fellowship, criticism negativism these things that's keeping us from developing Lord there's a lot we could shout about but judgment's got to begin in your house and that's what we're asking Lord this is a hospital where people can be healed and I'm glad tonight that now that the word's been preached the word will produce faith and Lord faith will bring the victory that overcomes the world Amen. While heads are bowed, I'm going to do something that I've not done. Before I ask you to stand, I want everyone tonight that wants the Lord to minister to you in some area of your life where maybe a situation or a circumstance or an attitude or there's been anger and you want to bring it to God. You say, you're going to embarrass me. No, if this embarrasses you, then there's pride there. I, can you do that? In your name, Lord, you deliver them and meet them where their need is. And...